Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being patient with us. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with my colleague and friend, uh, Senator Hancock. I'm Senator DeSonier. Both of us represent uh, Alameda and Contra Costa County in the, Sam in the um, State Senate. And we have the honor to have with us today uh, two people joining us who really should uh, need no introduction, the former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, and um, Art Pulaski, the head of the uh, California Labor Federation. So we're here to talk about a bill that Senator Hancock and I will present shortly in the Governance and Finance Committee, <coughs> SB, <coughs> excuse me, 372. SB 372 is an important part of uh, a series of bills that actually come under the he heading of the Ending Poverty and Inequality Caucus that uh, I was fortunate enough to start about six months ago here in the legislature that's a bicameral and bipartisan group of uh, lawmakers looking at poverty and inequality in California and how much it's grown. Uh, with the Supplemental Poverty Index, California has gone from a 13% poverty rate to almost a 25% poverty rate. And inequality is a big part of that. And for a lot of us, we think that this is one of the most important challenges facing this state and this country today. For myself, I think it's the most domestic uh, important issue of our time. And it's not just about the economy, it's about jobs and good paying jobs, but it's also about democracy itself. So this is one attempt and an important attempt. So what does the bill do? The bill has a sliding scale for uh, corporations who file a corporate uh, tax in California, they will pay more on their California corporate tax if the CEO of that corporation gets paid 100% or higher than a median uh, wage earner of that corporation. Uh, and then the money will slide below that if you're paying less in terms of compensation. All this is in the background and the rates will go up as the disparity is greater. Uh, again, this will be in governance and finance shortly, and we're hoping for it to get out of that committee, uh, and we feel as if it's a very, very important statement about our values in California. And with that, I'd be happy to have Senator Hancock add any comments before we hear from our guests. Thank you very much, Senator DeSaulnier. Uh, Senator DeSaulnier said this is a nationally recognized problem throughout the country. Thanks. And large part to some of the writing and economic work done by Robert Reich and other economists. This bill creates a positive incentive to begin to restore balance to the, what you see on that chart. It is simple. It's as simple as tax law can be, uh, which is notoriously complicated itself. But it is based on existing federal regulation, Dodd-Frank regulation. And Dodd-Frank was adopted because it was needed after our increasingly unregulated financial system. And the incentives created in large part by runaway CEO pay and the incentives that that creates for short-term economic thinking at the expense of the working people who actually produce the goods and services that we buy, that that financial system crashed, causing great economic instability throughout the world and real suffering for American and California families. So I am proud to support this bill because I believe that our middle class is at risk in this country and that our middle class is the bedrock on which American democracy was built. California has a history of taking on tough problems. We don't just stand and wring our hands, we forge solutions. This bill begins this, that process in this very, very important area. And I'm just so pleased that we're able to have with us um, today, Robert Reich, the former Secretary of Labor, uh, and the current uh, Professor of uh, Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator DeSonier and Senator Hancock. I, I'm here to testify on behalf of this bill uh, because I think that it begins the process of shifting the incentives operating on corporations back toward the kind of incentives we had 30 or 40 years ago when CEOs were paid 
on average 30 times what the average or median worker in their corporations were paid. What we've seen over the past 30 years is an extraordinary escalation in CEO pay relative to the pay of the typical worker in America. Instead of it being 30 times the typical worker, today the CEO of publicly held corporations is paid 280 times what the typical worker is paid. And in top Fortune 500 corporations or S&P 500 corporations, we see that the ratio is 350 times or more what the typical worker is paid. Now this is not only unjust, but it's also bad for the economy. Because when you have so much of the economic gains going to CEOs and top executives, there is not the purchasing power left in the middle class to turn around and buy what the economy is capable of producing. Hence, we have the slowest economic recovery we've seen in years. The middle class is not only under great stress in this country, but it is actually declining. How then do we change the incentives so that more and more of what the corporation earns goes to its workers and less to its CEOs? Well, this bill works in exactly the direction the incentives should be working. Remember, I said, in the early 1980s, the typical corporation CEO was making 30 times what the typical worker was making in that company. Now, in this bill, if a CEO is making 100 times or less what the typical worker is earning, that corporation's tax rate drops from the current California tax rate. The current tax rate is about 8.84% for most publicly held companies. It goes down to 8% if the CEO is earning 100 times what the typical worker is earning. It's a sliding scale. Big tax brackets. If the CEO is earning 25 times or less what the typical worker is earning, it goes down to 7%. In other words, companies that reward their workers and are responsible about executive pay are rewarded under this bill their tax bills go down. On the other hand, if companies want to award their CEOs huge pay, 200, 300, 400 times what their typical workers are earning, their tax bills go up. This is not rocket science, and this is not complicated. I understand there are uh, groups, uh, not surprisingly, like the California Chamber of Commerce, that thinks that, thinks that somehow this is a, a, a job killer, just the reverse. Remember, the biggest problem the economy has right now is the middle class, the lower middle class, and the poor don't have enough money in their pockets to buy what the economy is capable of producing. The job creators are not CEOs. The job creators are not the rich. The job creators are the middle class, lower middle class, and the poor with enough money to buy. And this bill creates incentives that reduce the amount of money going to the top and increase the amount of going, money going to typical workers. So this is a job creation bill. This is the opposite of a job killer bill. And this is not complicated because the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed in the wake of the near meltdown of Wall Street already requires companies, publicly held companies, to calculate the ratio of CEO pay to their typical workers' pay. That's already federal law. The SEC is in the process right now, the Securities and Exchange Commission is in the process right now of implementing that Dodd-Frank law. So companies will have to do this calculation in any event. The amount of additional paperwork is minimal. This makes sense. And I'm here to support it. Thank you.
Thank you, Secretary Reich. Now we're going to hear from Art Pulaski, who represents uh, many of the workers in the state of California through the California Labor Federation. Thanks, uh, Senator. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator DeSonier and uh, Senator Hancock. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Uh, perspective. The, the uh, perhaps most renowned of the corporate gurus, Peter Drucker, once admonished all of his companies to be sure that they do not exceed a CEO to worker pay ratio of 10 to 1. He said anything beyond that would be destructive to the workforce and to the society. So as was said earlier, it's no longer 10 to 1 ratio. It's not 20 to 1. It's not 40 to 1. It's not 100 to 1. It's not 200 to 1. In some cases, it's 1,000 and more to 1. And there is something fundamentally wrong when this happens, fundamentally wrong that affects not just the workforce of those companies, but the whole economy. So I'm here to say that um, I'm happy to be part of what really, in its essence, is a nonpartisan bill. It's a nonpartisan bill that gives corporations the opportunity to choose to lower their tax rates by simply accommodating the advice of Peter Drucker years ago and making sure that there's, there, the disparity is diminished and that we're more fair to the economy and help to rebuild the middle class. I'm delighted to be part of supporting this bill. Thanks very much. Thanks, Art. So um, we have some moments for any questions. Any questions? Yes. How does this affect um, CEOs who receive a lot of money in stock options, but not necessarily a lot of money in salary? Well, it, it covers compensation, so we've tried to include all of that. Um, that's a big issue because the federal government has moved to restrict um, the total amount that a CEO can get in wages, but obviously a lot of this been, has been driven by total compensation. I think Secretary Reich can speak to this much more eloquently than I can. Well, I'm not sure I can. Uh, in 1992, uh, then-President-elect uh, uh, Bill Clinton proposed that a CEO pay over a million dollars a year not be deductible from corporate pay. But what came out was not that proposal. What came out of the Treasury Department and Congress uh, was uh, a, a, a bill that essentially, as implemented, said as long as CEO pay over a million dollars is somehow connected to corporate performance, you can deduct all of that. Uh, that was the beginning of the stock option boom, because you just throw down a stock option and it looks like it's connected to corporate performance, even though we all know that was a, f a sham, because the stock market goes up, CEOs get the free ride, uh, they get all of the benefits of the stock option increase, mm -hmm. they did nothing but get that ride. might be a simpler and more straightforward way of addressing what you guys are trying to get at on the wage disparity. Can you address that? And then also, um, it's a two-thirds bill. Any thoughts how you might get this out of the Senate with uh, lacking two-thirds of Democrats at this stage? Well, we did have discussion with the committee staff about the other option. And as you said, Don, it's in the analysis. I think all of us agreed that this was a better way to approach it, with all due respect to staff. Um, as we respect them always. Um, but I think it's just a difference of the approach we're taking and the importance of the discussion as well. And I don't know if you have anything to add. And then on the, on the supermajority, we're, neither of us are naive as to the struggle we have before us. We're very hopeful uh, we, that we will have the support in committee today. And in this building, we take one step at a time. But uh, for me personally, um, California, as I think both of our speakers have said, uh, has been the starting place for many of these national discussions. And for me, as the, as the uh, one of the authors, uh, that's the point. And I think there's enough economic reasoning to pass this. I, I personally think that uh, the recession was a forewarning. Um, when you look at this kind of concentration as, no, as not having the expertise as the people up here with me, but as a former history major, there's very rarely in economic history where we have this kind of concentration of power where there isn't some kind of economic or social implosion at some point. And for myself, as a sm former small business person, I am concerned about that and what that means for democracy. So uh, 
that's a long way of saying we know this is going to be a heavy lift, but it's an important conversation for this state and this country to have. If I, if you, if you wouldn't mind, let me just add to that. Um, I think that both alternatives uh, hold a great deal of promise. The advantage of this alternative is it focuses directly on the ratio of CEO pay to the typical worker in that company. That's what Dodd-Frank asks companies to do. And it is not an academic exercise, because by seeing that ratio, that puts pressure on the companies, not just economic pressure, but also public pressure on those companies to do something about those wild ratios. It also exposes to institutional investors and shareholders how out of control CEO pay is getting relative to the pay of typical workers. Anyone else? Yes. Where does the U.S. stand among all of the other developed nations as far as CEO ratio to average worker? CEO pay in the United States on a purchasing parity basis, that is just looking at the purchasing power of the dollar relative to other currencies is far higher than any other country, any other rich country, any other country we compete with. Meanwhile, the median pay of American workers has not increased adjusted for inflation in 30 years. And we are starting to fall behind other rich nations. As the lead article in the New York Times yesterday mentioned, uh, there are already several nations whose median worker pay is in excess of the United States. So we are seeing CEO pay going in one direction, higher than any other country, and the typical worker's pay actually falling behind. I will say one of the disconcerting things about um, CEO compensation is, although we are uh, more challenged by it in this country. I know that I've read in the past few years that we have begun to export this phenomenon, and I know the Japanese have struggled with it from a cultural aspect in particular. Any other questions? My colleague behind me was doing the math there, which is never my strong suit. Um, but uh, it appeared in 2012 that it talks about the average CEO pay in California is about $5 million, and the under the, the, uh, the 100 times looks like they would still be able to get 4.8 million without any punishment here. I mean, does that sort of get at this gap that you're talking about, 4.8 million to us journalists? Seems like a lot of money, too. I don't know what the CEO of the Associated Press makes, but Don, if you need any help, we're we, we need, We need to talk on that part, but just <laughs> any thoughts on 4.8 million? I mean, I don't don't still there's, no, there's no real, I think this is what we settled on as a reasonable um, starting point. Yeah, if, 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 again, if I could, um, just suggest a hundred times the pay of a typical worker is not a huge sacrifice. If the typical worker is making $40,000, for example, and that's a, that's a rough estimate of a typical worker's wage, uh, that means that the CEO can earn $4 million and still the company gets a tax cut under this bill. And to put it in historical perspective, as the secretary said, um, and up until recent times, 30% 30, 30 was the average. So that's 30 when the, times. 30 times. So that's in the context of when the economy was growing much more, much more robustly than it currently is. One more technical question. For a lot of the companies in Silicon Valley, their workers, I presume, are paid higher, or they have a higher median than the, the state average because they're higher skilled jobs. So in that case, let's say, I, and I don't know these numbers, but uh, for an example, if the median worker pay at Apple or Samsung or some, not Samsung, Apple is, is $80,000 or $100,000, and you do that math, that's now $10 million for a CEO. Is that still fair? Well, it does indicate that they might want to be supportive of the bill. <laughs> <laughs> But there's been some recent news articles that there's a challenge in Silicon Valley as well as a lot of the average wage earners are starting to go down. And of course, they contract a lot of employees, which is problematic for a mm -hmm. lot of us, including the Labor Federation, appropriately. Mm -hmm. But okay. we're also supportive of companies that do have that kind of wage mm -hmm. level. 
Right. It's the companies whose wage level is so low that their workers qualify for public assistance, mm -hmm. which mean that the rest of us are in fact paying taxes so that those working families and those working people can qualify for food stamps and uh, Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. That's a problem that this bill will address. And there's an interesting perspective on this. If you look at the Bloomberg analysis of the ratio, you'll find an interesting relationship between the lowest paid workers and the highest paid ratio of CEOs. Um, for example, <clears throat> the highest is some 1,700 times the, the CEO of JCPenney. If you look at fast food restaurant chains, if you look at retail establishments, the highest ratios tend to be even there which means that those CEOs are making so much money that they are being reinforced by their companies to lower the wages of their employees so much as to push them off their own shoulders onto the public welfare. So taxpayers are, in, in essence, subsidizing those corporations with the highest ratios of worker to uh, CEO pay. We're getting the highest amounts of pay because we're subsidizing them with our taxes when their workers go on to public assistance. There's something seriously wrong with that. This hopes to address that, I hope, in particular. So for a company like JCPenney or McDonald's that isn't based in California but pays California taxes, how does the bill affect those companies? They, anyone who has to file a, a corporate tax return is a publicly traded company in California, which is virtually all of them, because right. they all want to do business here, would be mm -hmm. subject to the law. Okay. Thank you. And on, on your last point, I'd just say, as somebody whose other career was in the, f in the restaurant business, being a small restaurant, one of the m most troubling things to me is that a lot of the disparities are most um, extreme in the food service industry. You have mm -hmm. very large corporations that are paying their employees minimum wages, and to Senator Hancock's uh, point, are pushing a lot of those services off onto the public sector to provide them with food stamps and other subsidies. Mm -hmm. You've been wanting to ask a question for a long time, the business <laughs> times questions. The first one, uh, has there been any positive vindication of support from the Brown administration? Second question, uh, would a, I understand, acknowledging this is the legislation in front of us, would a similar measure be possible targeting privately held companies? And if so, might, would you see that as a, a smart next step? Now, I, I think for me at least, and Senator Hancock, we're focused on this. Uh, as I said, there's uh, quite a few bills dealing with poverty and equality that comes under the caucuses um, sort of beginning to look at this issue in California, but one step at a time. As to Governor Brown, we always respect his wisdom and his uh, sensitivity for what the legislature puts in front of him. But as you said, it, it is one step at a time. We're going to our first committee today. Mm -hmm. This is a new idea. This is a national conversation and a California conversation that has to happen. Uh, right now, we have national recognition of the problem. We have hand-wringing. California needs to begin to forge a solution, and that's what this bill does. It's a doable, practical solution that creates incentives for responsible corporate behavior. So, it is California starting this conversation? Has, has this measure been proposed or passed elsewhere? I'm not aware of anywhere else in the United States. As appropriate, we start in California. Right. <laughs> so um, if there are no other questions, I want to thank Senator Hancock and thank our two speakers. Uh, we're going to go down to governance and finance in room 112, uh, and we'll present the bill, and uh, hopefully that will be the first step in a long journey. Thank you. Thank you.